Thank you. Thank you all for coming. It's a much bigger crowd than I thought would make it here. So now that it's almost spring, it's 40 degrees hot. <laughs> I was just talking with Vic Hangus, and in 1970, I lived next door to Vic and, and uh, Ruana Knife Works. And uh, at that time, I was making ceramics and uh, had originally come here uh, attracted by uh, the prospect of studying with Rudy Audio, studying ceramics. I thought I wanted to make sculpture. And so I was making ceramics, functional ceramics, and selling them at art fairs and uh, at uh, local galleries, and traded Vic, you know, like 38 years ago, <laughs> a set of mugs for a, for a knife, a very beautiful Rwanda knife that I still have and still treasure. And, and, and he and Ju Judy, no, sorry. <laughs> Still, still have all, all the mugs. Eight of them. That's really amazing. <laughs> it's almost everything I have is broken. I think I have about one thing left. Um, anyway, uh, when I came here, one of the bonuses that I got by coming to the University of Montana was studying with uh, Walter Hook, as well as Don Bunsey and Maxine Blackmere and James Dew and that, that school of... Uh, of, uh, art professors that were at the university at that time. And uh, so I'm not going to start with my slideshow uh, that far back. Um, I've probably made a thousand things and it's kind of hard to sort through everything and show ceramics and sculpture and uh, all the posters and cartoons and paintings and uh, uh, so I'm going to start in the early 80s with some work that is more personal. Then I'm going to show some work that I've done traveling both in the, in the, in the world, beyond Montana and the United States, and in Montana, and how I learned a bit about the landscape and, and painted some of the landscape, and then how that affected some collaborative and commission work I did. So I picked out a few things from each of those uh, genres, and uh, that's what I'd like to show you. So if we could dim the lights, and put up the first piece um, and maybe get a little more focus on it. There we go. This is called Suburban Refuge and uh, it was one of the, my first self-published posters. Um, I had been doing quite a few posters for various uh, small businesses and uh, uh, nonprofit groups in western Montana. And, but what was also working on the self-directed paintings that were non-collaborative and non-commissioned. And uh, to make this connect to Walter Hook, I guess I should say that I always admired Walter Hook's gift of, of imagination and craft. And we can see that in his work here today. Uh, and I never got a chance to really, Walter would mostly talk about things. I, I rarely ever showed me how he, did anything. And I didn't have that many classes from him, but we'd, we'd see each other socially. He'd stop by my studio and visit and see how I was doing. And, uh, and basically, he'd just say, uh, the only way you're really going to make it as an artist, you just got to do it. And you got to do it, and you got to do it, and you have to make pictures. And, uh, you know, that really, I could, what I could show you uh, may or may not matter that much, but just, just make things. So I took his advice, and I've, I've made a lot of pictures. And a number of those have been published as prints and posters, so they have been more widely seen than some other things. So I'll show a few of both of those. Um, we could switch. The next slide. Um, these pictures that I'm showing you now really had to do with, uh, I, I think up until this time, I had, I had been making paintings that were abstract. And I had been making poster commissions that were figurative and realist. And, uh, but very two-dimensional. And I, when I started making these, I decided uh, I was going to try to start painting uh, uh, a three-dimensional illusion that had a concept behind it that was nature and the technological world of civilization that we live in colliding or interacting in somehow. And I'm still making pictures that have that basic theme in them, um, if we change. Uh, this one's called Kitchen Preserve. and. I started introducing things like 
the kitchen I grew up in. This is very much, I had, happened to have some friends in Missoula. When I visited them, I thought, oh my God, I grew up in this kitchen. That's it. Uh, it hadn't been remodeled yet. And uh, now almost all kitchens have been remodeled. But um, So there was a little bit of uh, retro uh, furnishings involved in some of these. Uh, but uh, uh, if we just keep going, the next one. Um, while, I, while I was making these, I was really just using birds as a metaphor for the wild uh, and, and natural world. And uh, as I did this, I learned more and more about birds and actually attracted the interest of uh, naturalists and uh, environmental and conservation groups who thought I was a bird artist. And I really wasn't, uh, but I learned more about birds painting them. Uh, this one's called Dinner Goose. Uh, and in, in, in the background, you can see, uh, I, I grew up in Great Falls, uh, and my father worked at the Anaconda Company, which had uh, arguably the tallest smokestack in Montana. <laughs> Anacondans think they do. I think we, we maybe had, ours came off of a slightly higher mound. But it was a good 500 feet tall and dominated the landscape in Great Falls. So that's kind of the, the stack back there, and uh, we can go on. Um, also, I, I started painting the animals that were in my life, like our cat Frida, and uh, uh, playing around with some things that were more maybe purely surrealistic. Uh, we can go on. Um, this one, uh, definitely more surrealistic, uh, but uh, using um, the realist elements and uh, learning how to put them in a three-dimensional space and make them appear to float uh, was something that I was excited about and learning about and was still uh, also in my personal life collecting furnishings that um, you see in the, in the work here. So various periods I would have a, a, a room that was retro 50s or it would be Hawaiian or it would be, each room would be a little bit different. Um, and uh, as you can see with the next slide. This one's called Leave it to Beavers. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> it has a lot of different uh, elements in it that really tell the myriad of little stories, little little poems, kind of throughout. So if you just look at one corner of the picture, you'll see there's 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 maybe something happening uh, there that uh, alludes to the whole picture. Or uh, you know, in this case, it was really a painting about a loss of habitat. But uh, uh, we can move on and also Molesworth Furniture, which is great. We went to Hawaii and, and I made this painting that was really a kind of a, uh, an ode to our vacation in Hawaii. And uh, it has a, a number of different uh, elements in it that are uh, Hawaiian fish and, uh, uh, you know, a Hawaiiana. But it was, uh, it was one of, the, probably one of the first complete paintings uh, that was inspired by travel. Um, because we started doing more and more travel, and I would make uh, notations and, and paintings. My wife Mary Beth and I enjoyed painting in the field, plein air painting. Uh, and that was probably starting about 20 years ago. We started making those paintings. And so my more surrealistic or modernist paintings, we can switch uh, to the next ones, uh, started giving rise to more um, elements of the landscape in them. Just from going out and painting, I started to learn more about the landscape and drawing these pictorial elements together. This is called The Return of Lake Missoula. And this is uh, just uh, uh, sort of meditating on, on the possibilities of uh, the, the, the return of Lake Missoula and, and the, the fishing opportunities that might arise. But all, all of the fish are native fish that live here. And then uh, here's the, the, the Wilma building and uh, the company that makes the fire hydrants in Missoula got wind of this, and they're in like Pennsylvania or something. And they wound up collecting this, and I got a really nice letter from the owner who said, uh, you're the first person that ever put our fire hydrants in a painting. <laughs> <laughs> he was so pleased. We can move on. This is called Heron Blues, and uh, at this point the animals uh, started moving out of the houses and, and into an an exterior environment, and this sort of marks that change. And also, they get a little darker. This is a, a night scene. And uh, 
This is kind of a, a combination of different Montana streets. There's a little Butte, little Great Falls, and a little bit of Missoula in this street. And this is actually the studio I was in at that time, and that's, I'm in there. I have the only light on because at that time I worked late quite often. It was, and that would be on Front Street above the Top Hat Bar in the old KGBO radio station. Uh, we can go to the next one. Um, this is called Return of the Wolves. And oftentimes when I would do a poster commission for a group, I, I made a, a poster advocating the return of the wolf to Yellowstone for Defenders of Wildlife in 1989 or 90. And that did happen some years later and, and uh, really became a, a, a historical uh, achievement in wildlife management. And uh, uh, But when I would finish working with the the field biologists and, and, and that, and was working on my own self-directed painting, um, things like this would come out. So this is the return of the wolves uh, on, a, on a more personal level. And uh, next. Uh, again, the wolf seen a little bit differently. And this is uh, a, a lithograph, uh, which is a form of printmaking done with, uh, in this case, multiple plates, each one made by hand and printed uh, in order on, on top of each succeeding color to form a, a, uh, a final print. And it's kind of hard to see here, but the, the, the wolf is, all, is filled with notations and, and uh, mysterious elements that have to do with mythology and, and social, uh, uh, historical um, uh, things that, that uh, connect the wolf to the society that that animal now lives in that we have created. And uh, it's one of those bridge animals that's between, you know, caught between human and, and, and human civilization and nature and uh, ranching and all of that. And we all know about that. Um, so next, I, I start, I found myself making more uh, paintings that had to do with that precarious point between uh, animals like the magpie who are survivors. They, you know, many people think that they should be our state bird. They stay here all winter. Uh, they, they survive. They're actually a beautiful bird, um, much maligned, but they, they seem to, uh, to survive very well. Um, next, another bird here. Long-eared owl happened. Oh, sure. And there's actually another bird uh, original painting that's behind the screen from that series that happens to be here that Todd Brandoff brought. So we can move on. Um, the blue wolf I showed you earlier. Uh, this is more connected to that. The animal pieces started to become more mythologically uh, uh, infused, I guess. Uh, as I got more interested in animals and started reading about the cultural mythology of animals. In most cultures in the world, they tell stories about themselves, or there are metaphors about the culture, including ours and sports teams, everything, that have to do with animals. And it's just really interesting. And, uh, you know, it, it goes back many thousands of years. And uh, uh, so that started coming into the work. Um, next. Um, in this one, the, the great bear and the, the landscape are you know, are, are united as one thing, and the, the bear has, be, has become larger in scale to the landscape, but uh, there's, a, there's a group called Vital Ground that uh, their uh, mission is to save habitat so an animal like the bear can continue to exist, because as soon as the habitat isn't there, then the animal's gone. And especially uh, major predators like the tiger in India and China, the, uh, the grizzly bear, um, many animals are uh, are losing habitat. And in this case, uh, in the ground below the bear are a number of things that allude to the, the social and the historic and the contemporary implications of, of what it means to, uh, uh, to be a bear in this time um, that we live in now. And there are, I can't quite see it, there are other things in the sky too that allude to that. Um, next. Uh, another piece from that same series 
This is called Big Medicine, and uh, pretty much uh, kind of connecting with the same symbolism. Um, everyth everything from uh, arrowheads and, and uh, Sharps rifles to uh, the, like a, a six-pack ring that's a little higher in the <laughs> ge geologic order there. Um, next. Uh, this is part of a series of paintings from about five years ago that had to do with uh, uh, mythology and realism and naturalism within the context of the Rocky Mountain area. And this would be a white bark pine, which is really, I call it the tree of life. And it's a tree that uh, is in trouble right now. Uh, it's, it, a lot of them are, are diseased and dying, but they're amazing trees and they're one of the only trees that produce a uh, um, a pine nut that is actually a, a very nutritious food. The birds, bears, uh, many animals uh, eat it. In fact, uh, like the Clark's Nutcracker will take a seed and fly across to maybe a, an area on the other side of, of, of the valley because these trees uh, tend to grow in high and remote places, uh, many of the surviving ones, like St. Mary's Peak in the Bitterroot or Glacier Park. And that's the only way the tree can really uh, propagate itself, is by the bird planting that seed. And the bird's beak happens to be just the right length. So when it buries the seed, the seed will grow. Sometimes the bird probably go back and get the seed. Squirrels also gather them in middens, and the bears raid those, and it's a very nutrient-rich food. And, and the trees have a lot of character because they tend to grow on cliffs and in high places where they're they gain a lot of character from adverse and dramatic uh, uh, weather conditions. So they're always interesting trees, and uh, that's what this one's about. So the time I wound up spending with the naturalist doing my posters wound up infusing itself into the work uh, that I uh, do. Uh, that's my uh, self-directed work. So next. And these also had handmade frames on them and were pretty bigger than the slides there. About, um, uh, four by five foot paintings. Um, this one I call Ascension. And, and this is actually an ivory build, build woodpecker there, which they think they saw one in Tennessee? Arkansas. Next. Um, another one, uh, call this one Northern Lights. And, and uh, next, I think. This, this one is called Stealing Fire. And in many cultures, uh, people tell stories about how they got fire. Prometheus stole fire from the gods in Greek mythology and was punished for it. Uh, woodpeckers stole fire in a number of different Native American mythologies. Stole it from the trees and gave it to people. And <laughs> we, were, we were on the moon before you knew it. It's amazing. This is Woodpecker Stealing Fire. Next. Um, I'm going to show you three slides here. Just, and this is just to kind of show how I make a painting. Uh, this is uh, uh, called Moonlight Rainbows. And this is really, we're just looking at a small 9 by 10 inch study for what would become a 4 by 5 foot painting, which is next. And also with a, a handmade frame uh, that's a unique frame. And uh, I like this idea enough where I decided to make a, a, a pretty large scale lithograph and about 26 <coughs> color, color plates um, based on that. Um, so we'd see that next. So that's, that's sort of the development of an image over, over three. And there were you know, smaller pencil studies and sketches trying to get at composition and that kind of thing. Um, next. This is a more recent painting. This is from last year. And I call this one Montana Power. Uh, these are buff buffalo nickels. Some have the, the Indian, some have the buffalo on them. Um, and uh, square butte in the background. And uh, you know, just really alluding to the, the history, energy, and, and uh, the true power of the American West. And, uh, in, I think it was 1865, there were millions of buffalo. Twenty years later, there were 
several hundred left. So the West changed really rapidly. And in Great Falls, where I grew up, uh, when Lewis and Clark came through in 1803, 1802, the place they saw the most animals of any place they visited on their trip was right around Great Falls. There were herds of bison, elk, there, uh, there were bears, uh, antelope, deer. It was just like the, an African uh, uh, game park or, or something, only it was wild and natural. Um, when I was growing up in Great Falls, you, you were lucky to see a, a gopher, you know? And if they put their heads up, they get shot. <laughs> so, uh, and I had no idea that many animals had lived there until I actually studied that later. Uh, it was something that uh, just wasn't even talked about uh, in, in school. Uh, what a, what a r ecologically rich area that was. So, um, next. Uh, this is also a recent painting uh, and uh, exploring uh, mythologically the context of the horse with uh, a Western element here, but also uh, other, other elements uh, going back to uh, um, uh, prehistoric images from, uh, from caves of Lascaux and uh, on, on through history, uh, Ming Dynasty, uh, Egyptian. Uh, there, there's many images uh, layered over the top of each other and very textural too. Um, and the next one is similar. Uh, the, the bull. The bull is particularly just a historically really rich uh, uh, figure in, in cultures all over the world. Um, so we'll have a little s space here. And next, I'm, I'm going to just show s some, some paintings I started doing from the travel. And those tended to be landscape. This is in Sicily. And the temple and the tree are the same age, about 2,500 years old, which I, I found astounding. And the painting is only five by seven inches, so it's a tiny, tiny little painting. My travel paintings tend to be smaller. Uh, next. Uh, this is from Ireland. And this is uh, a, uh, a minhir or a dolmen uh, that's probably f over 4,000 years old. Uh, that is in the western, uh, uh, near the coast, an area called the Burn. Uh, amazing. Uh, next. Uh, also in Ireland, uh, sh a curious sheep on a foggy day. Next. This is uh, also in Ireland, and it was the tallest, thinnest uh, stone standing in the British Isles, called the Dunfini Stone on, the, on County Mayo. On the, on the coast. Um, and rather than when, when the, uh, Ireland was Christianized, the stone had been standing for a thousand years, probably longer, and uh, rather than knock it down, they just carved a little cross on it and let it be, which is why uh, one reason that Ireland is so rich in, uh, in uh, pre-Christian artifacts is uh, that uh, they just incorporated Christianity into their old religion, kind of just were able to meld, and that did not. You know, many cultures, uh, as as a, a new religion or new ideas would come in, they would destroy the old the old stuff, and uh, that's what makes Ireland very interesting uh, artistically. Next. Um, meanwhile, in Montana, um, canoeing Holland Lake and uh, late at night, and and just being inspired by the Northern Lights. Uh, next. Uh, the Big Hole River, sunset. I also started floating rivers quite, quite uh, more often than I had before, about 1990, and that started getting into my work and fly fishing and other things. So, this other, other kind of work started happening at the same time as the animal and myth work. Um, next, the little flowers on Mount Jumbo. Uh, the shooting stars that are one of the first star, uh, flowers to come in the spring, about third actually, but you know, we're not too far from there now. Next. Had a chance to float the white cliffs of the Missouri section of the Missouri River, and uh, 
you'll see that this later leads to being able to incorporate that in the commission that I did. Um, so this would be a, the way it looks now, but it looked very much like that when Lewis and Clark came through in, in 1802, 1801. Uh, next. I was always intrigued by these uh, uh, boulders that had fallen out of glaciers. They're called glacial erratics in uh, Glacier Park and other areas in Montana. But in the cedar forest on uh, the west side of Glacier, there's there are just some amazing areas where that, because it, you know, it really hasn't been timbered, the trees just grow up and, and fall over when they die, and uh, they just create all these interesting patterns. So, next. It's the Missouri River uh, near, between Helena and Great Falls. And, uh, next. Uh, Rattlesnake Creek in winter. Next. Uh, driving the highways in winter. <laughs> Next. Um, this is a little study I did on location uh, in Rock Creek. And uh, I, I make quite a few little paintings like this that, that lead to more carefully done studio pictures. Uh, and uh, I also take a, a great deal, of, a great number of photographs uh, when I'm... Uh, out sketching and uh, you know if the conditions are too adverse then I just take photographs and, and work from those later and from you know ideas uh, but uh, whenever possible I like to sketch and, and, and paint too when time permits and weather permits and uh, so a small painting like this kind of is a touchstone to being in that place and then when I'm in the studio under much better conditions and no rain no bugs music you know all my materials there. I can make uh, make a picture that I think is like the next one, more like that. It just reflects more, um, being able to work at a larger scale. This would be a bigger painting, and uh, uh, considerably more detail, I guess, too. Um, both paintings have a certain character to them, so I want. I just kind of thought it would be interesting to look at at two of them, and and this is very often the case for all the paint pictures I'm showing you, very often at least one or two or three or more stu small s uh, color studies done and, and, and pencil sketches too before I reach a point where I start working on the larger painting. Um, next. Um, another studio picture that developed uh, quite large, or at least that big. Uh, and. Uh, what happened is I found uh, spending the time in nature and, and making, making these landscapes very satisfying and, and fun to do. Um, uh, so a, another element of, of picture making had, had been developing, and, uh, as well as the work I showed you earlier. So these two kinds of work sort of developed um, at the same time and uh, kind of feed each other. And uh, next, another one. And oftentimes uh, I, I find myself wor working with some of the, s some similar metaphors, uh, but in a much uh, uh, less a dominant way. Uh, and, uh, you know, a, a painting like this where you, you kind of sit in a quiet place and uh, I think of it as a landscape painting, although I have friends that go, that's not a landscape painting. Landscape painting has landscape. <laughs> but just a small, a small space like this where, um, you know, the, the, the leaves falling off the water birch uh, on top of the amazing colored stones that we have in western Montana. For instance, I got, when, I, when we were in Hawaii, it was just astounding how beautiful Hawaii was. But I looked at their rocks, and their rocks were all black. Some of them were blackish red. Others were, you know, just black. And uh, our rocks are like jewels. You know, you, you look in Rattlesnake Creek and uh, they're blue and red and green and yellow and uh, it's really a blessing. And, uh, next. Okay, now the next little group of slides will be how both these bodies of work wind up being uh, 
inspiration for collaborative or commissioned works that I make. When a group or organization approaches me about doing a print or, or a poster to help with fundraising and to help people understand uh, uh, the project that they're doing, um, I wind up having to really work with the client or with uh, the, the folks that uh, are representative of, of a group or an organization and to to come together. Um, sometimes they'll just say, well, you just do it. And I'll, I'll say, okay, I'll just do it. And But we'd like to see the sketches uh, <laughs> before. <laughs> oh, we don't like those very much. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the collaborative work is... Uh, uh, takes on uh, all films are, are done that way and they're not done by one person you know they're they're collaborative and uh, I don't really think of these things as being that's why I'm not saying whether it's commercial art or illustration because they're I I put more into them than than illustration and I'm I'm very uh, the the groups and organizations I work for I have to really believe in so I'm not like a I know some designers and illustrators who will work for anybody that comes in the door and do what they do, and they're like a fast gun. And I'm not that. I'm a kind of a slow gun. And I, 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 and I, don't, I don't do commissions for just anyone. But uh, a few of the ones that we'll look at next were for individuals, and some are for groups. So next. This was for a group called the Rock Creek Trust, which is trying to keep land um, open and accessible to the public the length of Rock Creek. And uh, this was done as, a, as a, a limited edition print and sold to raise money for education and uh, the development of the, the work they were doing, which was really nice because it was collaborative. Ranches, state, federal, uh, different groups, Child Unlimited, uh, you know, uh, ATV people, uh, uh, trying to come together and, and save something. Um, Next. Uh, this one um, is actually a photograph of the print itself, so you can see the, the uh, poster, I guess, poster print, um, the lettering there too. This one was called The Hush of the Land, and it's the scapegoat wilderness, and uh, collaborative between the Helena Forest Foundation and the Montana Wilderness Association. We had a, 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 an independent group and a state, federal state group coming together to uh, uh, work on various projects in, in the scapegoat wilderness. And uh, the great bonus for me on this one was a four or five day horseback trip into the, uh, into the wilderness and, and uh, you know, with, with some amazing people that were able to um, show us uh, the, that area and uh, didn't pay very well. That was the pay. <laughs> And, uh, but anyway, there are, there are some animals that are introduced in there. But Cecil Garland, when he first advocated for the scape, scapegoat being set aside as a, as a wilderness, uh, the term that he used was one of the things that was intangible but very important was something he called the hush of the land. And uh, trying to put tangible importance on wilderness is sometimes hard with nuts and bolts people, and congressmen who want, you know, it's like there's oil or there's coal or there's power or there's this or that. And it's, he was one of the first people to recognize the benefits um, in, in Montana uh, of will, will, the value of wilderness just as it is. Um, so that's what I tried to portray with this. Next. The painting I showed you earlier of my trip down the White Cliffs of the Missouri came in really handy um, later when I did this piece for the Lewis and Clark uh, uh, Foundation uh, and also the Lewis and Clark Center based out of Great Falls to commemorate um, the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial. So this is the White Cliffs of the Missouri. We see uh, Lewis and Clark and his men. Um, and this was really hard to do because I'm, I'm not a historic artist. There, there are artists that really are into this. They live and breathe it, and they dress up in the clothes and uh, do reenactments, and they're very knowledgeable about it. And, and I'm not. And uh, so I had to do a ton of research just to make those little boats correct and the people in them dressed correctly. 
But when they came through that space, and they didn't run into any Native American people actually through there, which was unusual. They just were off hunting or something. Uh, but there were a lot of animals, and it was a very wild place. Although after they cross through this picture plane, it'll never be the same again. So grizzly bear, bison, elk, wolves, birds, amazing. And it still looks just like that, except those are cows now. <laughs> Next. This was a piece I did for Blackfoot Trout Unlimited and also the Blackfoot Challenge. And there's a number of groups coming together to tr really do some an amazing things that uh, are pretty much, I think, uh, leading the way in, in uh, groups and organizations coming together for common purpose. And um, so this was uh, done as a as an art poster print, uh, both to raise money and awareness. Uh, and this is, most of us have driven by this on the Highway 200 on the way to Lincoln, as in, into the Ovando Valley. Next. Um, a painting done, commissioned by the city of Polson to raise money for the new public docks they want to build. Uh, and I had done an art poster of Flathead Lake 20 years earlier that had, uh, um, was sold out and you know people would ask for it and the city thought well what if we just have them do a new one and try to raise some money with it so I did this two years ago the first one I did was a view looking toward these the bird islands and then this one is the view from the bird islands looking the opposite way and this is kind of pulsing behind the trees here so, next um, Kind of collaborative, a, a commission done for uh, an individual and a friend. And I promised him I would do a, a Kingfisher painting for him for years and finally uh, finally did it. And, th and the way he got me to do it was I was, didn't have quite enough money to take this trip we, we'd already bought tickets for. <laughs> so he funded the trip <laughs> and when I got back I had to do it. <laughs> but I was glad to do it actually. And, and this is on the Blackfoot River and it went up the Blackfoot to kind of research it and find the right tree, and there was just this amazing sunset. It was just um, uh, incredible. And the kingfisher came by, and um, it was just like that. Oh, next. This is the painting or illustration for uh, a poster I did for a group called the Yellowstone Association, which is the oldest advocacy group in Yellowstone Park that raises money to, uh, for education and to hire naturalists, and they do just a lot of, a lot of great things. And they've raised m you know, tens of millions of dollars over the years that have all gone into uh, uh, programs that the government can't, doesn't quite have the money to fund. And uh, I call this bearing witness. And uh, at first I, was, I did four or five little studies for this, and I didn't do Old Faithful, I thought. I'm not doing Old Faithful. Everybody's done Old Faithful. And then they said, could you do Old Faithful? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I did Old Faithful. Tried to bring something different to it. Next. Um, so a group called Bear Trust International asked me to do a commission. And they work on habitat for bears all over the world, and the eight bear species. and. Uh, I was working on some of my mythological paintings and I did several studies of uh, kind of straight ahead bears in, in nature. And then I did a, a study that was more global and had some, some mythology connected to it and layering imagery, a, a little different way of approaching it. It's not the, the, la the landscape uh, with, uh, you know, a vanishing point. And, uh, they really liked it, so I was able to do a piece uh, that was more in context of some of the uh, the mythological uh, paintings I was making, and the, and the various bears. And a, a little story connected with this is kind of interesting. Um, a group of of women from Afghanistan, they were all teachers, were here about three years ago, two or three years ago, four years ago, and um, about eight of them. And they were touring Missoula, and uh, 
they came into the gallery on first Friday gallery night with their guide and they kind of looked at my work and you know because some of the work just it's so connected to where we live or to idioms or to uh, leave it to beavers you know they, they wouldn't they wouldn't get that they saw this and it was like boom they all went over and they were looking at it and then they wanted to know all about it and they were able to look at this and these were Muslim women from Afghanistan first time in the West and they could read it and uh, ask many questions about it and uh, that was exciting uh, because it was able to communicate to uh, people from another culture from another religion that spoke a different language so. next um, this is a recent piece of uh, landscape for um, Bitterroot Trout Unlimited. They have this print for sale and they're raising money for uh, work they're doing on uh, stream restoration and uh, especially tributaries that are clogged that uh, were spawning, uh, uh, traditional spawning areas for, uh, for uh, trout and for other fish species. Um, and this, the view here is, if you're north of Darby, the old Darby Road is on the east side of the Bitterroot Valley, and you can look down across the river and up at uh, the uh, Lost Horse Canyon. And uh, I spent four days down there this past June just looking for a viewpoint, and, and found that, and uh, just it was just uh, the right place. And actually, I didn't see the fishermen. There was nobody fishing. But there was a deer that swam all the way across, and... Uh, Next. Um, we're almost done, too. So, um, This is a, a piece I did that was commissioned by Montana PBS, public television. And uh, it's a print that uh, if you donate money to them, enough money, they'll send you one of these. And uh, this is, uh, I don't know if you can, this guy's a little out of focus down here, but uh, it's a pretty big print. And this is the front range of the Rockies um, with, uh, with a figure down here watching TV on this bluff with his dog <coughs> sitting in a comfortable easy chair <coughs> kind of with the wagon wheels on it. And, uh, <laughs> and that's, that's our dog, Dora. So next. And then I thought it might be fitting to end with this one. It's the last slide. And uh, since this is where we're at. And uh, this was a piece I did um, fairly recently for the Clark Fork Coalition to celebrate the removal of the dam. And I come from a background. My, my father was a blue-collar fellow that worked for Anaconda Company. And uh, I know there are many people here in Bonner that worked on the dam or have a history with that. So losing it can be both painful and but there can be a, a new future too. So I wanted to approach this in a, in a way that was uh, not negative toward the dam. The dam is going for numerous reasons. Um, and in, in my painting, um, it's disappearing. It's just evaporating kind of slowly. And uh, hopefully it's, it's celebrating its history as much as it is celebrating its, de its demise. And uh, original dam builder down here looks on. <laughs> and a little god nature of goddess over here cheer cheers the beaver on. And, uh, at one point, I had birds flying through the sky, and I had big trout leaping out here, and I, I took the fish out, and I took the birds out, and, uh, but, uh, and it's actually happening now. So uh, when I was working on this, I was kind of imagining what it would look like, and uh, the time of the year was autumn. So uh, there you have it. So <laughs> Thank you.